Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. We are an inclusive faith community seeking to live out the loving, just, and generous way of Jesus. We are participants in a long tradition that's less concerned with doctrines and dogma that demand total agreement, but a life to be lived, enjoyed, and given away to others. What unites us is a growing awareness that life is precious, that we are made by love in order to love. This community is comprised of and affirms the entire human family, regardless of race, age, creed, physical abilities, marital or economic status, gender identity, or sexual orientation. So, if you are curious and have come to see, if you are tired and have come to rest, if you are grateful and have come to share, if you are wounded and have come to heal, if you are joyful and have come to celebrate, if you are uprooted and have come to belong, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home.
Hello, Crosspoint. Glad to be with you today. If you believe in what it is we get to do together, please remember that an important way to sustain Crosspoint is through our financial contributions. If that's something you can do or something you want to know more about, uh, please go to crosspoint.org slash contribute, and then you can find out ways to support this community financially if you're not already doing so. Or you can text Crosspoint NC to 77977 and uh, get set up right there from your phone. And if you don't know what it is we get to do together, go to crosspoint.org to find out and maybe sign up for our newsletter. These are places where you'd find out things like what we're doing with our Easter services. If you're planning to join us for Easter online, you can do it just like this. Um, you, can, you can log on Easter Sunday like any other Sunday. But if you're meeting with us in person, I want you to know that there are gonna be two services rather than just the one. The first service will be at 9 a.m., then an identical one at 11 a.m. And this is simply to accommodate the larger number of people who are gonna be joining us for Easter. One of the ways we can make it so each of those services is as great as possible is you getting tickets. The tickets are free. Getting a ticket helps us watch the amount of people coming to the services so that we have a chance to balance, balance those services out uh, to accommodate the crowds. You know, So anyone coming to the main service, you, uh, each person that you might have with you in the main room, get a ticket. And this includes middle school and high school students because there will be no middle school or high school programming on, on Easter Sunday. So they're gonna need tickets too. Now, we're not collecting tickets at the door. Nobody's gonna be turned away for not having one. Again, this is for us to know ahead of time so we can distribute the total number of people as evenly as possible over the two services. That goes better for everybody if we can do that. So to get tickets uh, for Easter, simply go to crosspoint.org Easter, and you'll see it's, uh, it's pretty easy from there. Also, if you're looking for opportunities to get to know some others at Crosspoint, maybe dig in a little bit more, spring groups will be starting in April. Uh, there are several different groups that accommodate different interests and needs. Uh, so registration is not required for all of them, but there's a few of them where uh, registration is requested because again, knowing ahead of time, uh, make, that's helpful for those responsible for the group. So to sign up for a group or to learn more, go to crosspoint.org slash spring groups. And that's the theme, I guess. If you want to know more, if you want to get more involved, go to our website. It's right there on the World Wide Web that you've undoubtedly heard so much about by now. Okay, so today uh, for the message, we have a special treat. Dr. Jennifer Garcia Bashal is Associate Professor of New Testament and Christian Ministry at Campbell University, University right here in, uh, in North Carolina. She's an ordained American Baptist minister. She often preaches, she trains, she resources pastors. She's passionate about teaching the Bible and she does, does it through very interesting outlets like the Bible for Normal People and Baptist News Global. She's also the author of Scapegoats, the Gospel Through the Eyes of Victims, as well as the forthcoming book, John for Normal People, a guide through the drama and depth of the fourth gospel. So like I said, this is gonna be a special treat. So I hope you enjoy Dr. Jennifer Garcia Bashal. Happy Women's History Month. Maybe you have noticed the intentional effort that Crosspoint has made to focus on women's issues over the last several weeks. Part of that focus included inviting me to come and share some of the work I have done on women as scapegoats. I am grateful for the invitation and so happy to be able to be with you all today. As a means of introduction, I am a professor at Campbell University just down the road in Bowie's Creek. I have had connections with Crosspoint for a couple of years now. Since COVID, I have sent several of my students to your online service especially those who felt like they would not ever feel accepted or comfortable in a church setting. The work you are doing to welcome people from all walks of life and all places of faith is so appreciated. I am honored to be even a small part of the ministry here. Today, I want to talk about women as scapegoats. A scapegoat in our current context is someone who is accused by others of crimes or sins they are not responsible for, who then pay a price for those unjust accusations. Very often scapegoats suffer because they are marginalized already, people whose voices are ignored in society. 
You may have seen some news headlines last week about the two year anniversary of the Atlanta spa shootings that left eight people dead, six of whom were Asian women. The shooter, a young man raised in a Southern Baptist church, admitted that he targeted his victims because he wanted to eliminate the women who were a temptation to him. He wanted to eliminate the women who were a temptation to him. The women who died that day suffered because the perpetrator, influenced by his church tradition and his society, made them his scapegoats. He had learned to blame women for his own desires and conformed to a societal pattern of objectifying Asian women. These doubly marginalized and scapegoated women paid with their lives for the sins a man who would not take responsibility for his own actions did. This preventable tragedy reminded me of a story from the Gospel of John. The passage is a fascinating one about a woman offered up as a scapegoat and another scapegoat who saved her from stoning. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and making her stand before all of them, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us that we must stone such women. Now what do you say? They said this to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, sir. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. It may not seem obvious to all who read this passage that the woman saved from stoning is, in fact, a scapegoat. One could read it as simply another attempt to trap Jesus, or an example of what happens when keepers of the law hold a criminal to the letter of the law. But such a reading would ignore the nagging questions that rise to the surface with just a little bit of scrutiny. For example, why do the scribes and Pharisees bring an accused woman before Jesus to test? Why do they choose a sexual act like adultery rather than a religious offense like blasphemy? Why is the man involved in this alleged crime not arrested or accused or even mentioned? The first and easiest why to answer is why the scribes and the Pharisees are bringing an accused person before Jesus. The passage gives us a clear answer. They said this to test him, so they might have some charge to bring against him. They're trying to trap Jesus so that they can charge him with something. The implication here is that there is nothing that Jesus has done to warrant condemnation. He's innocent. So in order for any blame to be attached to him, some leaders of the society have to manipulate a scene and get a charge to stick. One of the most foundational truths about scapegoating is that the people with power, those in the center of society, single out people on the periphery in order to lay unsubstantiated blame on them. Rene Girard, who developed scapegoat theory over his many years as a scholar of religion, argues that scapegoating is a practice that almost all societies since ancient times have practiced. It is a hidden, even unconscious ritual that focuses the violence of a society onto a singular victim. When a community accuses that victim, turns against him or her, and eventually kills or expels him, it brings peace. More often than not, scapegoats are innocent of the crimes they are accused of but the community does not realize it. They believe the guilt of the scapegoat because to accept the victim's innocence 
would make them face the evil and violence in their own hearts, at the heart even of human society. Over the course of his ministry, Jesus was accused of many wrongs that he was innocent of. He was called a blasphemer. He was charged with being in league with the devil, and he was accused of breaking God's law. Here, we see the religious leaders trying to set up a scenario where they could accuse him yet again, but this time in a very dramatic, very public way. This story is part of a larger theme in the Gospels, the opposition of the religious and political leaders to Jesus. Jesus became a scapegoat for these powerful men because he challenged them and pointed out their own sins to the people. If they could get rid of him, not only would it maintain the status quo, it would keep Jesus from continuing to be a thorn in their side. So the story shows us that the religious leaders sought to make Jesus a scapegoat. But Jesus is not the only scapegoat in the passage. As I mentioned before, the accused woman also serves in this role. Women have been scapegoats for all of human history. Ancient peoples who practiced human sacrifice killed women in far larger numbers than men. But the scapegoating of women does not always involve ritual killing. Religious societies have often made women sexual scapegoats, laying the blame for sexual sin on women rather than on their male counterparts. This still happens today, as in the Atlanta shooting. When people respond to victims of violence with questions like, but did you see what she was wearing? Or what did she do to provoke him? We are shifting the blame for evil acts from those who perpetrate them to the women who suffer them. This is a covert form of scapegoating, as sinister as it is destructive. Notice that when the Pharisees drag an adulterer before Jesus, it is just the woman, not the man, involved in the alleged act. There are two reasons for this. First, the leaders understood that a woman is often a religious community's go-to object of blame. She's considered a seducer, a temptress. The accusation would stick better to her. The Pharisees also knew that it was a woman, not a man, who would arouse the murderous rage of a religious people. The bystanders in the temple that day were more likely to turn on a woman. That brings us to two other features in this episode that make it a scapegoat story. The chosen crime and the power of a crowd. Scapegoats are often accused of a society's taboos. Shocking offenses tend to rouse the anger of a mob much more easily than a common wrongdoing. One example of this from history is what is called the blood libel. Medieval Europeans often accused Jewish people of killing Christian children and using their blood in religious rituals. It was a horrifying and completely fabricated accusation, but it did its job. It enraged Christians and led to the death of many Jews in the Middle Ages. A more modern example can be seen in the protest over drag story hour. Right-wing groups have protested at these LGBTQ community events blaming the organizers for grooming or sexualizing children. Violence has erupted in several of these instances. In Jesus's context, nothing was more enraging to good religious folks than an adulterous woman. The Pharisees were quite cunning in their choice of the accused and the accusation. They drag a woman before Jesus whom they purposely describe as caught in the act of adultery. They are trying to scandalize the crowds in the temple. We don't even know if the woman is guilty of what they are accusing her of. They have produced no evidence and no partner in crime. The passage has already told us that they wanted to trap Jesus, so we probably shouldn't trust them to tell the truth about the woman. And even if she had been caught in the act, as they said, in their first century Jewish context, she could have been talking to a man in public that wasn't her husband, or walking around without a veil. The laws in the society made it easy to scapegoat a woman, especially sexually. But the Pharisees don't really care about her guilt. They want to rabble-rouse. 
in the story, they question Jesus relentlessly, surely allowing more people to gather. The tension among the religious crowds grow, grows and a murderous mob is about to form at the instigation of these indignant religious leaders. It's a scapegoating mob, and Jesus has to decide how to respond. So how does Jesus handle the scapegoating mob? Well, his initial reaction to the Pharisees' question, now what do you say, is to say nothing. And then he bends and writes in the dirt. Many scholars and preachers have tried to guess what Jesus wrote here because it is the only time that we see Jesus writing in the Gospels. Your guess is as good as mine, but it doesn't matter what he wrote. It is his action here that is important. He draws the attention of the scapegoating crowd away from their object of judgment. Jesus' actions break the spell of collective violence and give the crowd and the accusers time to calm down. Jesus quiets the scene and then finally he speaks. Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. With these words, he prods the people to contemplate their own part in the conflict to consider the sin and blame they themselves may carry. He de-escalates the mob violence by uncovering the scapegoat process for his audience. He shows them that they are not, that they are the guilty ones, not the one that they have dragged before him as a scapegoat. Jesus does not merely de-escalate the contagion of violence in this, this incident. He also provides a key that will help prevent future scapegoats. He systematically removes all the qualities that make the adulterous woman a scapegoat. First, the scribes and Pharisees have singled out the woman as a horrific sinner, caught in a crime considered shocking in the eyes of society. Jesus levels the playing field between the leaders, the crowd, and the woman by forcing everyone to examine their own sins. By disqualifying any sinner from stoning the woman, Jesus insinuates that either all sins warrant the death penalty or no sins do. The sexual sin they accuse her of is no more deserving of punishment than any of their sins. It is certainly not a sin that separates her out from the rest of them or justifies her being stoned. After Jesus directs the accusers to look at their own sins, they slowly walk away. The crowd that was out for blood has now disintegrated. It is at this point that Jesus turns his attention to the woman and speaks the first words actually addressed to her in the story. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She says, no one, sir. The story is a short narrative with few words exchanged between the characters, but over the course of these nine verses, the author has told a story with great impact. With Jesus' subtle actions of deflection, we see him calming a scapegoating storm, soothing the crowd, and thwarting the prosecutors. With his words about throwing the first stone, he removes the scapegoat target from the woman's back and focuses attention where it belongs, on the wrongs of the accusers. Lastly, with his words to the woman, Jesus frees her from blame and treats her like a human being made in the image of God. He refuses to acknowledge her inferior position, the position that had prompted the religious leaders to scapegoat her in the first place. There are many qualities introduced in the story that illustrate the woman's inferior position in her first century context. She is a woman with no one to stand up for her. She is an adulteress accused of a sexually shaming act. She is nameless, identified only by her sin. And she is unimportant enough to be dragged before Jesus as a criminal worthy of death. By the end of the episode, however, Jesus has stood up for her, pardoned her, and treated her as a valuable human being on equal moral ground with the crowds and the religious leaders. Jesus' acknowledgement and acceptance of the woman does more than just save her life. 
It lifts her out of that place of otherness and isolation from which scapegoats are plucked. Jesus gives us a glimpse into how to create a future without scapegoating, a future where we turn our gazes to our own sins as Jesus encourages the crowd to do, and where we treat those who are marginalized and targeted for blame, not as scapegoats, but as moral and social equals. So we have established that this passage is a scapegoat story in which Jesus interrupts the cycle of blame and violence. It shows us that people in power tend to project their own sins onto those who are already marginalized in society. It demonstrates that Jesus wants us to look not to the guilt of those around us, but to our own guilt. That way, we can recognize our own culpability and stop putting blame on others. You might expect this story to be titled, All Are Sinners, or maybe No One Can Throw the First Stone, but that is not the case. Most Bibles title this passage, A Woman Caught in Adultery. This title does the exact opposite of what Jesus does in this passage. It draws attention to a scapegoat accusation instead of highlighting the guilt of the scapegoaters. And so the woman in the story becomes a double scapegoat. The scribes and Pharisees scapegoat her, using her position and her alleged act to trap their primary scapegoat, Jesus. But we as Christians have continued to scapegoat this woman. Biblical interpreters in every century have muddied this story's message about universal guilt and grace, and instead focused on the sexual guilt of the accused woman. In fact, it is the church's preoccupation with sexual guilt that almost caused this story to be excluded from the New Testament. Early manuscripts of John's gospel do not contain this story. Others have it in various places throughout Luke and John. One might assume that this means that the story is not an authentic event from the life of Jesus, but the best scholarship on the Jesus tradition suggests otherwise. Because this passage continued to find its way into different contexts in the Gospels, it is likely that it is authentic. The problem is that the message of the passage contrasted with the message of chastity that dominated the early centuries of the church. Church father Augustine believed that the story was often omitted because it made Jesus look too lenient on adultery. He understood that it is too hard to resist scapegoating an adulterous woman. Jesus may have been giving us a formula for including scapegoats and for curbing the scapegoat instinct, but his message did not sink in especially in a culture that so easily and so frequently scapegoated women. Now, I want to zoom out from this story and talk about the bigger picture of scapegoating. Gerard's scapegoat theory highlights how we as humans, especially those of us in the center of society, tend to project blame on people who are different or marginalized. In ancient times, many of these victims of blame were executed or exiled. In modern times, we create and perpetuate systems of oppression that cause suffering for innocent scapegoats. And then we justify their suffering by putting blame back on them. It is not a ritual killing, but it can result in death for those scapegoats. For example, large groups of Americans have scapegoated immigrants in recent years, executing smear campaigns against people fleeing unrest in Central America. They say that these immigrants are rapists and drug lords, that they've been taking jobs from other Americans, that they hurt our economy. None of these accusations are true, but many people believe them because it allows us to take our eyes off our own problems, our unjust and greed-riddled systems, and blame someone else. People suffer because we have created scapegoats out of refugees. Christians have participated in this scapegoating. Some Christians have even instigated it. But according to Gerard, we should know better. When Jesus died, he died a scapegoat's death. He was innocent of the crimes levied against him, but the political and religious powers of his day killed him anyway. When the Gospels tell Jesus' story, drawing attention to his innocence and to the violence that converged upon him, they provide us with the antidote to scapegoating. 
The mechanism of scapegoating only works as long as we believe we are sacrificing and blaming guilty people. As soon as the innocence of our victims is revealed, the scapegoating ceases to work. People will stand up for innocent victims and will eventually be able to recognize their own complicity and guilt. For Gerard, then, Jesus is the scapegoat to end all scapegoats. His voluntary death, the death of an innocent scapegoat, revealed the scapegoating process. It forced us to acknowledge the evil and violence that beats at the heart of human society. This revelation shows us who we are. And by doing that, it saves us from ourselves. We Christians of all people hold the key to stop scapegoating. Jesus showed us how we can raise the voices of victims, protect them from oppressive forces. The story of the woman saved from stoning is just one example of this. Then, in his scapegoat death, he exposed the powers of society for their violence and injustice. If we read Jesus' story, we should be able to recognize where and how our societies continue to produce scapegoats. And we can stop the cycle of violence and blame because we know the truth. We must reveal to others how the powerful in society scapegoat the marginalized. We must confess our own complicity in systems that continue to cause unjust suffering. We must put our focus on the scapegoat to end all scapegoats so that we can prevent other scapegoats from suffering. This is our responsibility. May God give us the strength for the task. If you would like to know more or get connected to Crosspoint, go to crosspoint.org. If you're in need of care or assistance, go to crosspoint.org care. And welcome home 